All right, guys, welcome back. Another podcast episode here for you. Um, I don't know. I, I go into this one. It's based off of I'm combining an email question that I received <clears throat> actually a long time ago. That, I, that was an unread message that I hadn't hadn't um, responded back to. Probably have responded to a little bit in the past. Um, it's kind of, kind of why I was going back and forth on this podcast episode. If if we talk about it, I feel like a bit of a broken record, but I also feel like there's always little variables and twists to each to to these, um, especially because they're coming from specifically from people's questions, whether it be DMs. This is an email. Um, I've also got a, a a message that came through Facebook that I that came in Monday. <clears throat> Today is Tuesday. Tuesday. So. Um, I haven't had a chance to respond to it yet, but I saw it and I, I went, well, that one piggybacks off of that email that I was going to respond back to. And so it's, it's, it's all revolving around, um, hold conditioning. These questions are, I know we've done a lot. And as I think back on it, of all the episodes of podcasts we've done, of all the videos we've done on our YouTube channel, Instagram, Facebook, whatever platforms, um, we actually produced a a standalone video on hold conditioning that's available on our YouTube channel. Yep. It's also available on our website. You can, is it downloadable? Can they download yep. that? Yep. So you can download it. We used to sell it. It was 10, I think we used to sell it for 10 bucks. It's an hour long edited video. Like we literally filmed it at the time, at the time we were filming one of our training videos. I think we filmed it during the same window of time we were training our shed training video. And when, it, when we went to, we were going to include it in the shed training video. And then we realized, that chapter alone would have been an hour long, and the shed training video is already three and a half hours long. So we're like, man, I just, it's so long. Not that, not that that mattered because I, I again, I, I don't care a lot about time specifically when it comes how it relates to training a dog. Um, I do realize, so it wasn't so much the turn off of the idea of a longer video being four and a half hours, in because I figure hell, these are things that these people bought. So like, why would you complain that it's too much information, right? So. I didn't worry about it from that perspective. My worry about it was if you have a full hour on one chapter in a four hour video, that means 25% of that video is about one specific topic or chapter. And so from my perspective, thinking about how we piece this together, I thought if I'm a, if I'm an outsider and I'm, I'm, I purchase something that's four hours long and 25% of it is about one specific thing as a, as a, watcher or follower of that, I go, man, that really is important. Um, it may take away from the rest of the, the importance of the other items. So if you got, if you got just for round numbers, let's say there's 10 things you cover and one of those 10 things takes 25% of the time, it's rather disproportionate as far as the value, right? It's really valuable. So in that discussion with our editors when they were producing this thing I made a decision and I said I just think it's standalone I think it's so important and I do think it is such an important process in the step of training a retriever that it it warrants its own um its own like place to live and so we decided in that going back and forth on it we decided let's pull it out of the video and let's offer it alone standalone and at the time I was like, yeah, and, and that makes sense. And at their kind of recommendation, they said, just offer it as a secondary video. It's, I mean, there's a lot of training videos out there that I own that are less than an hour to begin with. So like, it's not like I'm shorting them with content. It's, and I think it's pretty valuable. So they said, you know, if you're not comfortable with it, just break it out as a separate video and offer it at a price you feel fit. So we, we did it deeply discounted. I think it was like 10 bucks in, com in comparison to a $25 video is which most of our training videos are. So I looked at it and I went, I don't, I, I was torn back and forth on, do you charge people extra for it? And the, the, the takeaway was, yeah, let's do it, but we'll do it at a rate that I think is very reasonable. So we did that for a year probably. And then I got to thinking about it and we kind of took a shift and this was a few years back. This is probably four or five years now three or four anyway, we started thinking about it in, in general. And you'll notice as a rule, if you followed us for any length of time, um, the longer, the, the more you'll s probably see this. We, we have shifted to the idea of, I, th I lean towards the idea of supporting those who support us the best we can. And 
that meant we just we made a decision we said we're going to take that video and instead of charging for it because it was a hot it was a good topic it was a topic that i receive a lot of feedback on it's it's the idea of uh, you know the questions come up of force fetch versus hold conditioning um trained retrieve whatever you want to call it the alternative to what what that whole conditioning process looks like and there's a lot of variable there's a lot of varieties of, of it out there um and degrees that people take it in different directions but i just decided i said you know what it would be more valuable to me to share it with those with anyone or everyone that is interested in seeing it with the idea of i think it's better for the dogs and it we we offer an opportunity for people to um open themselves up to that style and we decided we'll we'll give it away so we ought we'd still offer it on our website it's free you can add it to your cart um you don't even have to buy anything you can just go to the website and get it and download it um we also have it available on our youtube channel so it's just such a it's just such a common topic um that comes up and and so that's where i went back and forth on god dude do another podcast episode on it but when you get this many questions and you get you get them as consistently as you do I do think there's a little bit of different, a little different angle that we get, um, we touch on each time we answer one. So the explanation is out there why we're doing this one. Here it is, I'm gonna read the Facebook message to first, and then I think I'll read the, the question on um, email that I got, and then I'll, then I'll address them because they do overlap. But here we go. I just wanted to, so this is coming from a guy named Ryan, actually relatively local from Wisconsin. Um, I just wanted to drop a note and ask a pretty simple question in the grand scheme of things. I've got an eight and a half month old female lab about two and a half weeks into hold conditioning. I've got her walking on the picnic table we use for training while holding the dowel. She's doing great. How long should I continue at this point before I move into the on the ground with the dowel stage? She hasn't dropped the dowel at all since about day four, but her and I both are enjoying the process and I don't want to rush it. Thanks for your input. Love the YouTube channel, and I'm trying hard to get caught up on all of them. So, uh, sent a nice, sent a picture. Good looking dog on a picnic table, um, wooden dowel in its mouth. Looks very familiar. Now, I'll go to the email. The email says, comes from, I think the guy's name is Chase. It says, Hello, I've watched nearly all your YouTube content concerning hold conditioning. I'm left with a question. I'm currently training my Yellow Lab May. My question is, do you do table work with all the items you want fetched, dowel, bumper, antler, birds, etc., before moving to the ground, or do you use the dowel on the table and then move off the table and introduce everything else on the ground? Also, what are you looking for to determine when they're ready to move off the table? So again, it's a similar question um, and with a little bit of differentiation. I... I think the point I wanted to make with answering this, so I'll specifically answer this a little bit towards hold conditioning, and then I'll probably touch on some in general that I think you could apply towards hold conditioning, the idea you can apply towards hold conditioning. You also can apply it towards training in general and probably life. And I think if you've listened to some of our stuff in the past, if you've listened to enough, you will, I think, start to see some of the parallels that are drawn between our approach and the approach I take with, with our dogs and where that impacts and hopefully overlaps and maybe rubs off on some of the stuff that I'm doing outside of the dogs. Um, and, and I just think that for me personally, that's one of the greatest things I can attribute to training dogs is uh, I, it has allowed me to become a better person in a lot of ways. Um, it's allowed, it's thinking about the philosophies of it and the approaches and making adjustments accordingly have helped me no question in my training specifically, but also outside of training. And that's, that's valuable. I think, um, it's something that I'm not afraid to, to, to talk about and share more today than 10 years ago. Um, partially because 10 years ago just didn't know it enough. Um, I felt it, didn't know it enough, didn't know it strongly enough. Couldn't I didn't have the I didn't have the experience to share ten years ago. I didn't have the experience to share fifteen years ago. Um, I didn't have the experience to share prior to that when I first kind of first started getting into really more serious working with dogs. So um, I think it's a progression that at some point, uh, hopefully, you become more and more comfortable with it. You see more and more. 
you get to the point where you start to develop this this confidence in the process, this trust in the process. Ben is famous for telling me to trust the process. Um, and, and I am a process person. I really like the idea of the, the, the beginnings, the middles, and the ends. And, and the middles, really, for me personally, the part I really like. Um, and so with specific to these questions, the one thing that's coming up here is uh, let, let's say, how long should I continue at this point before I move to the ground with a dowel stage? I don't think it's based on sessions, duration, time. I totally think it's dictated by the dog and how the dog is doing performance-wise. So, um, you know, what I loved about this comment was she hasn't dropped the dowel since about day four, but both her and I are enjoying the process and I don't want to rush it. Isn't that refreshing to hear? Uh, it is. Uh, I, I shouldn't say. I shouldn't pose it as a question. I'll pose it as a statement. That is refreshing to hear. So, I love. I don't. It, it takes a while before you start hearing question, um, comments like this. I shouldn't say questions. Part part of a question, but in it, it, it's a statement as a comment. And the, and the beauty of it for me is it's 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 motivating. It's 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 another nudge. It's another push to say keep doing it. Keep going with this because. That's what I love to hear. I, I have talked about how important it is to enjoy what you're doing with this and how well, how much that impacts success. So part of the reason I think Ryan is doing well is because of the simple statement that he says, but her and I are enjoying the process. I don't want to rush it. Beautiful. So Ryan, the, the X's and O's answer of when do you start to move to the ground with a dowel? Quite honestly, you might... It, you maybe could do it now. I don't know that you will know until you try. Because if you have, it sounds like, I'm reading it as, you've got a lot of confidence. You've been doing it for two and a half weeks. And if you did it every day for two and a half weeks, and since day four, two and a half weeks is seven, 14, 17 days, something like that. And since day four, you haven't dropped, so you got 13 days. Let's just say those are the numbers. 13 good days in a row without dropping the dummy. I guess my question would go back to if I'm if I'm analyzing it from you, I'm looking for how she hasn't dropped it, but is she where's her position? Is her chin up? Does she know to has she started to understand do I have to hold her and brace her the whole time or can I take my hands away? Can I move away from her? I think it's real important to move her feet prior to putting her on the ground because I think there's a big difference between being elevated and sitting um, now you you're on a picnic table, so I see your setup is a little bit different than mine. You've got a slip on, and I'm assuming that slip collar on, in the picture. You've got a slip collar on or a slip lead around a flat collar. First off, I would take the flat collar off. If you're going to put a slip on, I take the flat collar off because it just gets in the way of the effectiveness and the, the purpose of the slip. But you've got this slip lead on. I would take the collar off, obviously, but then. My question is, is how come? Is that to lead her around? Are you leading her back and forth on the table with it? Is it as a, in, as it is, is it serve as like an anchor to make sure the dog doesn't move? Is that tether acting as my tether? My tether is usually clipped or, or hooked above the dog's head to avoid the dog being able to duck out. It doesn't let my dog move left or right, but it also doesn't let them duck out and want to lay down. I have a lot of times where dogs want to lay down when they get something in their mouth. So it, it stops that dog from being able to do that. And it makes it so that I don't have to be the one to physically restrain them. I do it intentionally. I don't want to be on the other end of this thing, anchoring my dog down. So my question when I see your picture is, you know, where are you at with that? Can you take that lead off? I would want that lead off and the dog to remain. The position I'm seeing in the picture is great. Dog's chin up. Um, when you do this on the video, you can take a screenshot probably that and put it in, but the dog's chin is up, um, real nice position, but that's a one millisecond flash that I get to see of your training session. So I don't know. Cause I, I'm, that's all I'm seeing. Um, and it looks real good, but I think I would be asking all these internal questions of, can I move the dog around when I move the dog around? Does it put her head down right away? Like, I don't like dogs that as soon as I start to move them on the table, they duck their head down because if you watch some of our stuff and you, you'll see that process, I don't like the idea of the dog having the ability to just simply open its mouth and all of a sudden the dummy drops out, out of, or the dowel drops out, out of gravity. Instead, if you have them nosed up, head tipped back, even if the dog decides I want to open my mouth and release the pressure off of the object, 
the dummy is not going, the object is not going to fall out so quickly. Because if that happens and I'm not in position to be able to catch it, then the dog is going to get away with an action that I don't want to happen. And so I think you have to be careful of the timing part. So the timing with praise and the timing of correction. And if so set yourself up to be able to have good timing. If you, you might have the best timing in the world, but if you physically can't act on it, it doesn't matter. So those are questions. I would want, before I bring the dog, me personally, before I bring the dog down into the ground, I want him to be able to be free in that elevated position and moving in that elevated position without adverse effects to the positioning and the, the way that hold and delivery is, is happening. I would want to go down and back and forth on there. I'd want to heal them back and forth on lead maybe to start out with, but off lead eventually, because when I make a retrieve, remember all of these pre these pre steps are working up to the finished thing, which is the dog going out, picking something up, bringing it back. We're not going to do that with a lead on. So I don't, and I don't use, I don't use check cords. I don't use long I, I think that if you have to use those, you probably are too far. You've moved too fast. You move too quickly. So I talked with the guy yesterday about the idea of his, him. He had questions about hold conditioning as well. And it was a real good conversation. But when, in his specific situation, he was making some retrieves, using his environment to his advantage by going off of his garage. He closed all the doors in the garage. He'd throw the dummy out of a small room with the door open. The dog would run out into the big garage, pick it up and bring it back into the small room. And it kind of like acted as a funnel for him. So I could totally see how that worked. But what he said was after so many, the dog would start to hang up and not want to come back. And so that's usually when he would reel it in using one of those long rope things is what he described it as. And I said, yeah, you know, check like a check. He's like, I don't know what you call him. So check cord. He said, yeah, I guess that's what it is. And I said, my problem with that is you're gone too long. Like in his specific situation, he went too long. So the dog got bored, checked out, quit doing it. And so his fix to it was, well, don't, no worries. I got this long thing. I'll reel the dog back in with. I look at it and go, I don't want to have that crutch. I don't want to have that, those, the, the, the thing to fall back on of, well, I can always reel them back in and because the behavior that led up to that need for the correction could have been avoided altogether. If we had just quit earlier, make two or three good retrieves and then be done and leave the fire burning a little bit so that the next time you do it, the dog gets excited, wants to go out and back, out and back. The habit, I don't want to have good stuff happen. And then he wrote it at the end with the idea of, well, that one he quit on. So I had to reel him back in and now we'll end it. So what did you end it on? You ended it on definitely not, not the best one. And so as far as repetitions. So I think I do want the dog, if you need that lead for guidance, use it. But then understand that there's another step there. You have to be able to do it without the lead before I would be comfortable saying, now go down on the ground. Because you got to keep in mind, what the reason why we put the dogs up on the elevated platform is it helps them focus, helps them stay focused. It takes away a little bit of their confidence. And which, which with a bold dog, it allows them to spend a little bit more focus and attention on me. With some dogs that are not so bold, I still elevate them. But it, part of that is, is to build their confidence. Because if I can get them moving around on the, if I can get a dog that's not so bold, a little less confident, if I can get them moving around on an elevated surface, I know I'll be able to do it on the ground. So there's multiple reasons of why we kind of do this from a, um, a standpoint of steps. And they're all kind of logically linked together. Not often, not always understood all at the same time. And so the idea there is a reason reasoning behind this. So I think your answer is you need to do all those things first on the table before we're putting them down on the ground. And then if you put them down on the ground and the wheels fell off, my answer is not upset and go, bad, this didn't work. It's we just didn't apparently do it long enough or we missed something up there on the table. So just go back. It's the idea of in training, I might take two steps forward and everything goes good. Then I might take another two steps forward and the wheels fall off. So then I go, okay, somewhere between step one or step zero and step four, we got one and two good, three and four threw a curveball at us. So now I'm going to back up maybe to one or to two. I'm not just going to back up to three and go, I, maybe that's the fix, but it's hard for me to start with the problem. 
I'd like to look at it and go, what is the problem? Why is the problem there? And go back before it and start building my way back up towards it in the right direction. So it's a very fluid process, back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. But if watching some of our stuff, you'll realize, you'll, you'll understand that a little bit better after you get it, after you hear me say it enough about the importance of balance. Balance is not one extreme one way or one extreme the other way. And balance is not standing still. It's really hard to balance something when there is no movement. It's a lot easier to balance something when there's slight movements because you're able to adjust. And so our goal is to achieve movement, measurable, controlled movement so that the thing doesn't fall down. But it's also never stop. And it's also never be extreme one way or the other because then you start to tip. So that's, that's, a, that's a micro answer to a micro question with a macro answer to maybe a macro um, vision or, or look on the training in a more general standpoint. Now, i got to go quick because Ben's got class here in a little bit. But I want to go and I want to touch on this. The, so that's the that was the Facebook question. This is the email question that kind of overlaps, um, and it and it says, my question is, do you do all the items that you fetch the dowel, the bumper, the antler, the birds before moving to, on the table before moving to the ground, or do you use the dowel on the table then move to the table and introduce everything else on the ground? There's no black and white answer to this, and I don't think it needs to be. I think some folks. When, and, and I love the idea of people really analyzing this process to the depth that they do, because I do think it's really good to have an understanding of as many micro parts of it as you can. But I also think that with that, you have to take instruction in all training with a bit of a grain of salt and with the idea of that worked maybe specifically for me with one particular dog in its specific situation at that moment. But the next day, don't, don't watch one video or one series of videos and go, that's the way it's done. Because after you realize, if you watch more, the more you watch, the more you realize this, that there are lots of variations. And so over the years, again, for me, it's taken some time and it's still in the process. Like I'm still in the process of getting better at it is the idea of the more we see, the more we do, the more opportunities we have to, and that's where that's where problems or, or issues that come up are actually real beneficial. And I like to I like to look at it as when things don't go well, boy, those are really good opportunities usually for us to learn, both the dogs and us. So the more opportunities you have, the more dangerous you are when it comes to like responding and reacting on the fly and having a having this having all these experiences to flash back on and, and make reference to and then try something. And I think that's the idea is you try something, you see how it goes, and then you go back. And so I think for, in this case, it's Chase. Chase, I don't, there's not a black and white answer as to you need to do each item on the table first, then down to the ground. Then to the, You might end up doing some on the table and then the ground. You might end up doing some on the table, then the ground, then back to the table. You may end up switching objects a couple times. You, There is no one way. I would say try it. If Do not try it on the ground until you're great on the table. Going back to that last question that we just talked about. And so while you're up there on the table, maybe, maybe try changing an object and see how that goes. If that changing of the object changes the effects of the dog's behavior, you recognize and realize that the behavior is not as strong or stronger than the influence of the object itself. We run into that a lot of times when it comes to the environment. We get really good in one spot, and then we try to replicate the behavior in a different spot, and things go haywire. It's because the behavior is not stronger than the, than the impacts of the environment. And so we need the behavior to be foolproof, regardless of the outside distractions which a lot of times is environment. So you got to test that. There's a, there's a point where I really like it when people are studying what we're doing and replicating and, and, and trying to follow it really closely. I do think there are times when you have to do that because that's the mechanical part. I think the mechanical part is the idea of like, you do have to make a correction the right way at the right time. You do have to be in the right position. You need to, there's these physical things that need to happen. But then there's this idea of understanding when, where, and how to move. 
and move on or move back. And that is something that comes with practice. There is no like one single indicator that a light bulb turns on and says, next step, go ahead. There's no like, you've create, you've earned this many points, you can now go to the next phase. That's not the way it works. And so you, you need to watch as much to get an understanding, practice as much to get an understanding and to get your chops down, get your, flu, get, get your understanding of how it looks to actually do it, how it feels to actually do it. And then do it enough, make enough mistakes, recognize those, make adjustments and correct, and then continue to go back and forth, back and forth, back and forth until you get the forward progress. That to me is the most exciting part. The the it's it's figuring out all those little steps in between. Not the idea of A and Z and it's exciting to start, it's exciting to finish. The middle is a pain in my ass. I think too many people think that. And so, and that makes it real challenging to get to Z because if the middle parts are a pain in your ass, that's the majority of the time. That's the majority of the work. That's going to be the parts that create, that, that demand the most from you as a trainer. It's not that difficult to handle a dog that's got everything. It's not that difficult to handle a dog that's got nothing because you, if you have realistic expectations, you don't have, you understand the dog doesn't have anything, doesn't have any skills yet. So that's not real difficult to start, start in on. It's in the middle that gets difficult to deal with because you're going to recognize the frustrations that come. You're going to recognize the goods and the bads. And if you can't handle those swings, it's a really difficult thing to get through the process. And that's where I stress the idea of, I love uh, this message from Ryan that says, uh, but her and I are enjoying the process. I don't want to rush it. Yes. That's, that's beautiful. So, all right, guys, that's it for this one. I know it's kind of a quick, I guess it's not that quick. It's almost 30 minutes, but, um, it's specific to hold. I hope we touched on some specific things with hold, but the, the thing about hold much like most of the training processes are, you're not going to get Unfortunately, you're not going to get all the answers in one podcast, one video, one uh, session. One, It's just there's a lot, lot of um, micro things involved with it that we have to incorporate all of them in order to make the thing work. And so I and it just is the topic that just keeps coming up. Um, and I'm real glad about it. I, I don't say it as a negative at all. It keeps coming up. Because people are interested in it. And I can't, I could, I literally, I should do a count. This week alone, I bet you I got 10 or more messages, messages or phone calls that were regarding hold conditioning and the the commonality, they all had a little bit different question or twist to them. But the common thing about it was, man, I'm so glad I found this. And I asked people, how did you find it? Searching on YouTube where it came up on YouTube and it's connected to, force fetching because they didn't want it either they didn't want to do force fetch or they were thinking about doing force fetch and they wanted to know more about it and for whatever reason this keeps coming up uh this video that we've got some of the videos that we've got so that's how they stumbled across it and i go that is exactly what i hope happens and if you don't like the idea of doing hold conditioning and you are a force fetch person then use force fetch i don't care I, what I want to do is not change your mind. What I'd like to do is help those that don't want to do it. I don't want to do it. I do not want to go through that process. I just don't agree with it. It doesn't mean I, I, I have nothing bad about the person that's doing it. If it works for you, use it. If it doesn't work for you or you don't want to do it and you think you'd be better off doing it a different way, here's how we do it. If it works for you, use it. If it doesn't, find something else. So... Thank you guys. Appreciate the support. Going to ask you to do me a favor if you would subscribe to the podcast. Uh, If you'd hit the subscribe button, if if you're listening to it on an app, if you'd leave us a review. I am putting it on Ben's plate to figure out what's wrong with my phone. I we used to be able. I used to be able to see the reviews. Now for some reason I can't. I'm going to ask you to give me a flurry of reviews because Ben's going to fix my thing to be able to let me read. I want to see the reviews because I want to know know what we're doing well and what we're not doing well. And it also is a major way for us to help grow the awareness of it to others because the more reviews you leave, the better other people are able to search it if it's something that 
they are interested in. So I'm going to ask you to do me that favor, and I'm also going to ask you to go over to our YouTube, and this is for Wonder Boy. Ben is busting his ass on 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 getting, and Caden. Caden's actually, we've got a two-man front now going on on YouTube. And so him and Caden, I've given them a challenge to grow that, and they are doing their best to do it, and I want to help support them. So if you are not a subscriber, if you'd subscribe to our YouTube channel and turn the notifications on so that you are aware when we put new stuff out. Ben's got class in three minutes, two minutes, and we got to run. Talk to you soon.